Traveling along at 60 miles an hour Avoiding all the flashy shiny cars All were dashing quickly to and fro It was then I noticed a man upon the road With his guitar and his bedroll I began to wonder where he was going Travelling man, travelling man You keep on travelling on the road Going through life all on your own Sometimes you must get very weary Hello once again, uh, welcome to the Vision Channel I'm Ron Jones and um, as we arranged, my guest is again Jonathan Gray, the international explorer and the archaeologist and the author. And we're going to talk a little bit more about some of the really staggering discoveries that he and his team have made. Jonathan, welcome back to the Vision Channel. <coughs> now, when, when we chatted before, we talked about your home background and the Bay of Plenty and uh, a few other things and we talked about the important discoveries regarding the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah which I must say I found ever so convincing. I want, I want uh, to go back to Egypt now and uh, you know the days when the children of Israel were having a pretty rough time uh, a pharaoh who didn't know anything about Joseph had come to power and they were virtually slaves. Will you build the picture for us of what you feel it was like uh, so that we have the background ready for slipping across the Red Sea? Fine. Well, uh, the pharaoh, of course, went to the extreme of ordering male babies of the Hebrews to be thrown into the Nile River. Yes and uh, there was one mother who didn't want that fate for her child and through uh, her daughter she managed to get the baby placed in a, a floating uh, basket yes. near the spot where the king's own daughter came down to, yeah. to wash. Yeah. I guess one that was mother, pretty clever. She knew the maternal instinct. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, as it turned out the, uh, the baby was uh, pitied by the princess and he grew up in the palace to become uh, trained for future royal duties. But Moses, of course, was also uh, made aware of his uh, yeah. fleshly descent. Yeah. And uh, one day his, uh, his tours led him through a place where an Egyptian and a Hebrew were fighting. And in a rage, he killed the Egyptian. And he then knew that his life would be in danger if he stayed around. So he had to leave the, the country? He had to get right out of the influence of the Egyptian yeah. Empire. And the nearest spot he could go that was safe was the land of Midian, over across the... That was side. to his father-in-law, was it? He, he, he then married a woman yeah. uh, over there, uh, Jethro's yes. uh, daughter. Yeah. Yes. And about 40 years after his, his uh, fleeing, uh, a much older and a much wiser man, having been... Yeah. Uh, tamed down a little bit so yes. after what watching after the sheep <laughs> yeah I guess shepherd training is is not a bad thing for somebody who has to become a future leader has, you can have sympathy with people great now you, you have made it plain that the, the children of Israel took the longer route around uh, than they need have taken and that that route across the Red Sea brought them again into Midian, where in actual fact Moses had heard the voice of God when he was minding uh, the sheep of his father-in-law. Why do you think God led them that way then? Well, I do believe that the Lord had something in mind uh, for the Hebrew people. Yes. Um, first of all, he wanted to take them back to Midian because he was going to train them there to be a nation before putting them at the crossroads of the yeah, world. Right. And uh, secondly, he wanted to do something with Pharaoh. Yeah. Um, and um, this lo lo long roundabout route would eventually lead them into a detour against the Red Sea where they'd need God's intervention. Yes. And uh, not only would the Lord's name be revealed 
among the nations of the world by what he did, was to do to Pharaoh, but also these slaves who were, were being rescued had lost touch with faith and hope and love. And because of the slavery? Because of the, the slave conditions. master's whip, yes. Yeah. And the Lord wanted to show them now that in a spot where they were brought, they would have to depend on him and he would have a chance to demonstrate his love and his care for them so that they developed that faith and love that they needed. Now, I, I tell you what intrigued me, the, the, the thought that um, Moses had to go back there as, as part of the fulfillment of a declaration that God had made about uh, worshipping or s sacrificing or meeting in this mount. Do you remember mm. that? Yes, the Lord said Moses at the burning bush, yeah. Moses, I want you to bring the people back to this mount. And so you're saying to me that they had to take that route in order for that declaration to be fulfilled. That is right, because the two routes, the first one would go direct yeah. to the promised yes. land through the Gaza Strip, yes. whereas this one would take them right across uh, the land, uh, around into uh, Midian, yes. and then later, after their training, they'd go up north. Right. Can you tell me how many Israelites you, you think there were who might have made that journey from Egypt? And can you at the same time tell me what distance they had to travel from coming out of Egypt to the spot where you say they crossed the Red Sea? Yes, uh, the Red Sea actually has two arms. It comes up yes. between Africa and, and Arabia yeah. and then branches into the Gulf of Aqaba on the east and the Gulf of Suez on the west. But both of those are still called the Red Sea. Yeah. Um, the distance to the Gulf of Aqaba is about 200 miles. Yes. Uh, the uh, the other Gulf is a lot a lot closer, but I don't believe that's where it happened. Yeah. So they had to travel 200 miles. That's right. On on foot. On foot. How many? Uh, the story says there were six. I'm sorry. Yeah, 603,000 men plus yeah. women and children. children. So you could probably estimate a minimum of two million people. Yes. D do you think, uh, from a human standpoint, uh, that the Israelites might have panicked when suddenly they came? They were confronted by the Red Sea, and they knew that very speedily, uh, Pharaoh's horses, horsemen, chariots, and even Pharaoh himself was catching up on them. And if they did panic, how, how did God respond to any possible panic they might have had? Yes, I'm sure they panicked. There, there was terror, I'm sure. Um, you see, they'd left in a, in a time when Pharaoh's army and, and all the Egyptians were mourning. And there was a required period of mourning before burial. And that gave them quite a, quite a length of time that they could yeah. get away before they would be chased yeah. after. But suddenly here they were in front of the sea with mountains on both sides yeah. and nowhere to escape except by going back the way they'd come. Yes. And suddenly behind them comes the army. <laughs> They're between the devil and the deep blue sea. Literally. <laughs> Literally. I wonder if this is where it began. <laughs> Pharaoh the devil. Yes. Um, so who else could they turn to but the Lord? And uh, this was his opportunity to show his hand and his might on their behalf. Now, you will know as well as I do that there are sceptics who have said that the, the place where they crossed, the water was so shallow that, that it was no problem for them to cross anyway. And therefore, there was no miracle. How, how, do, you, how do you answer that? And what was the miracle as far as you read from the Bible? Well, I believe, Ron, that by trying to escape the biblical miracle, a skeptic uh, runs slap bang into another miracle that he hasn't expected. Um, certainly, uh, if it was shallow water, yeah. uh, and you have a whole army of Egyptian soldiers being drowned in it, um, for example, uh, Josephus says there were 251,000 foot soldiers came in that army. Mm. That's a quarter of a million men. It is, yeah. Plus all the chariots, plus yeah. thousands of chariots and horses. Yes. Uh, and um, you mean to tell me that in shallow water, those horses could none of those horses could survive, and and all that great army with all its equipment could be lost, and even to this day, not a trace of it found. Now that'd be a miracle, wouldn't it? It would. It sure would. Now Exodus chapter fourteen, and verses twenty one and twenty two, tell us that God uh, blew with a strong wind, 
and that the waters became a wall. Tell me, will you, Jonathan, how can waters become a wall? That puzzled me for a long time when I realised the depth of the water we're talking about here. Yes, how deep? Uh, about uh, 2,000 feet or more. Is it? Yes, it's very, that's in the centre, very, yes. very deep. Now, if you have... Um, uh, if you have a wind that's going to blow the water, that, yeah. that requires a miracle for that all that depth of water to be removed. A powerful wind. A, a mega uh, hurricane and yes. more than that. Yes. Nothing that we've ever seen before. Uh, but how could that stand up and be like two walls? Yes, that's what I wanted to know. Yeah. Uh, it was only when I went into the next chapter, Ron, that there was a yeah. text that just jumped out at me and I didn't know, I didn't know how I'd missed it before. And it speaks there of the waters being congealed. Yeah, becoming yeah. solid. Yes, because yes. It, uh, you know, if you get water congealing, congealing means becoming solid, as you yes. said. And the only time water is solid is when it turns to ice. Yeah. And if you have two walls suddenly turn to ice, only God could do that so quickly. Uh, you've got two solid walls and it's going to take a few hours for that to melt away and collapse. I mean, he could make, it, make the ice a mile thick or or 10 feet thick, yeah. but that's up to the Lord how much he needs to make it. But you've got two walls of ice uh, holding back the rest of the sea and the children go through it on the other side. So, so those walls of ice not only kept the water back, but they preserved the uh, children of Israel from the consequences of that strong wind when they were crossing. Yes. Is that a fair assumption? That's very true because once you've got the water turned solid, yeah. uh, the wind can drop. And it's yes. not going to blow them away. They yes. can come through. Right. Now, I understand that you say that in diving you found uh, an underwater bridge. I'd like you to tell me a, a little bit about that. And what other evidence is there? Like, if that's the exact spot, then there should be some evidence somewhere of at least some remains of, of Pharaoh's army or chariots or wheels. Have you found anything like that? Yeah, we have. And something else too. Um, on both sides of the bridge, there's a pile of rocks going out as far as we, we can see. Yeah. Um, it's, it's a line of rocks. It's just like somebody pushed aside and pushed the rocks to the side so that the stones to the side so that there'd be a smooth passageway for the people to follow through. Yes. And between those two lines of stones under the sea, yeah. um, you have scattered um, areas of coral and that coral cements objects which are very easily discernible. Um, we've picked up uh, horses hoofs and uh, various skeletal parts of people uh, and horses that yes. are scattered all over there and in between them there's wheels. Four spoke wheels, six spoke wheels, eight spoke wheels. Why aren't the wheels still on the chariots? Well, the Bible does say that the chariot wheels were all taken off. The Lord removed them. Uh, yeah. By some wonderful miracle, he took all their wheels off before <laughs> before trapping them. They couldn't f when the when the water started to collapse Cut behind up, yeah. them. Uh, they couldn't escape the because wheels. the wheels had gone. Yeah, they they got stuck there, and the wheels came off. <laughs> <laughs> and um, these wheels are scattered around. Uh, some of them have axles joined onto them. Yes. Some of them don't. Yeah. Uh, the chariot parts we've found uh, have no wheels at all attached to them. Is that so? The biblical story is just spot on. Spot on. You is. know, and what enters my mind, Ron, is yeah. how how did Moses, who wrote that inspired account, know? I mean, he was up on the other end of the shore. He, how did he know what was happening miles away on the seabed here? That's right. Uh, the Lord must have revealed that to him. Yes, that's terrific. I was intrigued to hear about Solomon's pillars. Will you, will you tell me just a little bit about that? And then I want to move on to some more of your discoveries. Uh, well, there's two of them. There's yeah. the one, one on each side? One on each side of the crossing, yeah. yes. Uh, Phoenician style uh, columns, which uh, is compatible with the time of King Solomon. And uh, the uh, the one on the Saudi side had as an inscription on it which says, uh, it basically, erected by King Solomon in commemoration of the crossing of the Red Sea on dry land. So th do you think that th those pillars uh, are at the spot where you say it ha all happened? Yes. Uh, the Saudi one has now been taken down by the Saudis yeah. since, since the discovery. Uh, the Egyptian one was lying in the water at the time it was found, Egyptians in. 
and now it's been put up by the authorities beside the road that goes yeah. south from Nawiba. Absolutely enthralling to hear of these things that prove so conclusively the marvellous truth of the Word of God. Now, I want to move on to 1982 when Ron Wyatt declared that he had discovered the Ark of the Covenant. When you heard that, I understand that you were quite sceptical about it. Why oh, were you sceptical? Oh, was I, yes. And as a matter of fact, I wasn't interested in the Ark of the Covenant at all. Uh, but I was sceptical of it, yes. Why were you sceptical? Uh, I thought, well, now that's the ultimate uh, <clears throat> discovery. Yeah. Uh, how could a man who's found this and this and this have also found this? Uh, I guess that's just a natural human reaction. You, you thought he'd made too many discoveries. I thought he'd just gone too far. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, but then, in 1991, a change came about, and you became involved with him, I think. T tell me just a teeny bit about that. I went out with a briefcase full of objections against the man. Yeah. And uh, I went to shoot him down, actually. Did you? Yeah, I was shot down. You've got a events. cruel streak about you. Uh, yeah, I know, I know that's <laughs> yeah. true. Um, as a matter of fact, I did, however, because I had now committed my, my case to the Lord, I said, Lord, uh, I could be wrong. I, I believe I, I'm not wrong, but I could be, and I want you to reveal to me just what the facts are. And I'm willing to admit I'm wrong if I am. And in a wonderful way, he, he showed me clearly that uh, this man was speaking the truth. And I would trust my life to him from that time onward. Uh, can you just very briefly tell our viewers what the Ark symbolised? It was a golden chest which had uh, two cherubim, two yeah. angels over the top. Uh, it was a symbol of God's throne virtually, but it, it was more than that. Yes. It contained the Ten Commandments. And the Bible says that we've all broken God's law and yeah. we're all sinners, and we all must die, and we must all be separated from God. But that through the blood of Jesus Christ, we yeah. can be saved. That's to do with the mercy seat. That's the mercy seat yes. over the top. A strange yes. name for a golden box to have yes. a lid called the mercy seat. Yes, it is. But of course, it's a strange thing for God to have mercy on people that don't deserve it. Yeah, it is. And uh, the blood of animal sacrifices was a prophecy or a symbol of the yeah. blood of Jesus being shed for us. Yes. And it's precisely because we are sinners that we need salvation yeah. and need mercy. And um, the ark symbolised so, that. Yes, the ark. Thing. Yes. It is true that various sites have been declared to be the resting place of the ark of the covenant. And there are those who believe that it was taken out of Jerusalem. Uh, by the Babylonians, but you maintain that the Ark never left Jerusalem. What makes you so convinced that all the other theories are wrong and that yours is right? Well, Ron, I've made it my business to check out the other theories because um, if it, the Ark could be found in one of those places, then it certainly could not be in Jerusalem. Is, is there not a possibility that the Ark of the Covenant, which Ron why it found is in actual fact a replica. Uh, there's quite a bit could be said about that one. Um, yeah. But when I consider the whole story of how this was found in Jerusalem, yeah. uh, there were a set of miraculous circumstances which show a, show a supernatural hand yes. throughout the whole thing. There was the pointing arm, there was a, the stranger that came yeah. to give his blessing. Yes. There, were, there were various, uh, there was the six men who died in a tunnel. Yes. And uh, now uh, there was something about this spot that that is very unusual, to say the least. Not only that, but um, the uh, the location is absolutely unbelievable unless there could have been a divine hand involved in it. Right now, I've seen that you uh, have used that phrase "never left Jerusalem," and if we're honest about it, that's a pretty broad statement. Mm. What what viewers would want to know. Have you now found the exact spot where the Ark of the Covenant is? Well, uh, Ron, it's just outside the northern wall of Jerusalem, yes. a couple of hundred yards, uh, not far from the Damascus Gate, uh, at a place which it has always been and still is known as Skull Hill. Yes, place of a skull. Place of a skull. That's right, I've got it. Yes. 
Near the bus station. Very close to the bus station. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Have you been there? Yeah, I have. Oh, you, you can recognise the spot then. Yes, you interview me for a minute. No, go, no, we won't. You go on, tell me. Yeah. Well, the exact spot and, and um, what, Jeremiah's Grotto. There, there is on the maps of Jerusalem a place called Jeremiah's Grotto. Yeah. Um, it's not the genuine Jeremiah's Grotto, but it's very close. Now, for a minute, let me recap. Uh, what, you, what you say is that the Ark of the Covenant is actually beneath the spot where Jesus Christ died on, uh, at the place of a skull. Now, that means that the Ark of the Covenant was put into place long before the death of Jesus took place. There are those who would say, well, that is quite a terrific coincidence. What would you say about that? Well, I would say that, uh, it, yes, it was a coincidence. It had to be a perfect coincidence, organised by only one person could organise and plan it that way, and that'd have to be God himself. It's not something that a human being would automatically expect to be found that way. No, it isn't. Um, unless it had been found, no one would ever have could, could dream up a story like that. Uh, there's evidence, I, I do believe, that marks this as the crucifixion site, and I have, haven't any doubt about that. There were some that. holes. Uh, That's right. Yeah. Um, there, there are th three, three niches, like recessed yeah. bookcases in, in the rock yes. at Skull Hill, and then just down below them, about 14 feet, there's a platform, and in that there are three cross holes. Yeah. No, uh, there are four cross holes, actually. Yes. There's one higher up, and then lower down there's a... a a lowered platform around that with three more cross Absolutely poles. terrific. Now, mm. I've heard a statement that uh, the cracks and splits have been found. Uh, what exactly do you feel they prove in any case? Well, I never used to think there was much significance in the fact of uh, the cracks being mentioned in the Bible. Yeah. But uh, I guess there's a reason for everything. And scripture specifically mentions that the rocks were rent or, or, yes, or split. Yes, it does. Yeah. Now, there are, are two cracks. There's one going up the wall behind the cross holes. Yes. And there's one going down from from the elevated cross hole. As I mentioned, there are four cross holes. There's yes. one elevated on a platform, and there's three around it in front, lower yes. down. Yeah. But from the elevated one on the left hand side of that cross hole, there's a big split in the rock that goes straight down, straight down vertically. Yes. I, I and uh, there's significance in that because immediately where that crack comes out lower down, 20 feet down, there's a big cave. Yeah. And this is the cave where the temple artefacts are resting today. You say that uh, blood has been found on those cracks and that some of it has actually seeped through onto the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant which is, is buried in a cave about 20 feet below. What evidence do you have uh, to suggest that that might very well have been the blood of Jesus? Uh, yeah, that's a good question, Ron. This blood has been tested uh, in more than one place and uh, it's different from ordinary human blood. It is human blood. Yes, uh, but not like mine. Not like yours and mine, no. Not. Uh, we have 46 chromosomes. We have 23 from the father and 23 from the mother. Yes. Uh, the uh, chromosomal count in this blood is 24. 23 from a mother and then a Y One. chromosome which, which is necessary for this person to be a male. And yeah. uh, this does suggest that the person whose blood was spilt onto the mercy seat was somebody who did not have an earthly father. So it's an evidence of the, of the virgin birth of Jesus. Yes, and that uh, his father was God. Do you feel that uh, more discoveries are necessary before it can be said with real conviction that the Ark of the Covenant has been found? Or do you honestly feel that sufficient discoveries have already been made that we are able to say to people today with an assurance, the Ark of the Covenant has really been found. I believe right now we can say unequivocally the Ark of the Covenant has been found. It's in there.
What I would like to see happen, however, is for the excavation, which has now been covered up. Yeah. And that, that was one of the re prerequisites of the excavation taking place. The government made that request, uh, it, did they? It, it was made at the request of the owners of the land. Oh, yes, right. Yes, with government permission. Yeah. Why do you think the Israeli government called a halt to the whole thing? Well, the Israeli government uh, has ha has become very nervous about this discovery. They just don't know what to do with it. Do they think it might affect the peace, peace process or something like that? Is that anything to do with it? Oh, yes, oh, no. most certainly. And I believe there's a political reason and a religious reason, yeah. there, Ron. Yes. Uh, but politically, that they are afraid of a holy war. If this object becomes the source of a, uh, of a fanatical gathering of of extremist Jews yes. who would want to use it as an excuse yeah. to uh, to take the Temple Mount and build a temple, it, it must it must be really exciting to be involved in uh, such marvelous discoveries. But what do you think these discoveries tell us about God and us? Well, these discoveries are life-changing. They have not only in, have made me appreciate God and his character much better, but I see that there are thousands of people around the world who are accepting him, atheists and others, because to them it shows the reality of God. Yeah. God does exist. His word is true. I mean, the, the Bible is God's word. It is historically and, and in, in true to the, in detail. The minutest details are true. Yeah. Now, if you get to trust somebody's word and you find that he can be relied upon to tell the truth to the minutest details, yeah. and he then makes promises that may affect your personal life, you tend to accept the fact that you can trust him. And I know that many people have found that they can trust God because his word is true. When he promises he can change their lives, when he promises them that through Jesus Christ there is salvation and the eternal life, can be given, then they are more ready to accept that. Great. Mm. I, I can say amen to that. Just one more question, and it's a question I ask everyone that I interview at the end of the program. Jonathan Gray, uh, archaeologist, explorer, author, all the rest of it. What does Jesus Christ mean to you, Jonathan? just as we sit and chat here today. Ron, Jesus Christ is everything to me now. Uh, I lived without him for many years and my heart was unfulfilled. Today, I, I could be a poor man and if, and if I still had Jesus Christ, I'd be the happiest man on earth. Jesus, to me, is my best friend. He's my saviour. Um, he's, he's everything, in fact, I would, if I was given a choice of just having him and having the world, I would say, take the world, but give me give Jesus. Me great. Jonathan, thanks ever so much for coming to chat with me again. And I know that you, you have quite a heavy schedule in front of you. And uh, I do appreciate you giving the time in the middle of that uh, to come for these particular programs. And we pray that as you go on your way, that God will continue to bless your ministry mightily and some more staggering discoveries, please. Mm. My thanks to Jonathan Gray for being with me as my special guest today. And uh, my thanks to, to the camera crew uh, who have helped me with this program and to the hosts who have taken us into their home for the shooting of this particular program. And of course, from all the camera crew and myself, our thanks to you, the viewers, for giving us the opportunity and the privilege of coming into your home once again. So this is Ron Jones saying goodbye for this time. God bless and take good care of yourself and take good care of each other. Traveling man, traveling man. You keep on traveling on the road Going through life all on your own Sometimes you must